Okay, I think we'll stop. So, welcome to the first session of the day. The first, the first talk will be about optimizing linear key recovery attacks with a fine Walsh, a fine Walsh transform tuning by Antonio Flores. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, as you said, the topic of this presentation will be uh, the improvement of uh, worst transform based linear key recovery attacks using some novel worst transform pruning techniques. First, uh, I will briefly describe linear key recovery attacks and the context for this problem. So in a linear key recovery attack, we consider a linear approximation of some part of a block cipher. And uh, we will extend this linear approximation by adding a key recovery part, usually a few rounds at the top and a few rounds at the bottom. And we use the what we call the key recovery map in order to describe the value of the linear approximation as a function of the plain text, the cipher text, and the key. So normally what we do is we divide the plain text, the cipher text, and the key into several segments, and we will ignore those which have no influence on the value of the linear approximation. In this paper specifically, we also consider two types of key guess. We have both uh, outer key guesses, which are parts of the key which are so directly to the plain text and ciphertext material, and we have inner key guesses, which are not. So the aim of an attacker is uh, to compute uh, the experimental correlation for all key guesses for some given data sample. So they get a list of plain text ciphertext pairs. And they want to compute the correlation of the linear approximation within this set for each possible guess of the key. So in the case of uh, the form for the linear key recovery map, which we have considered in the previous slide, this experimental correlation looks like this. And originally, uh, we knew of two algorithms to compute this vector. The original one, which has complexity, which is the product of the size of the data sample times the total number of key guesses, and a second one, which uses a distillation step and whose complexity has two terms. The first one uh, is proportional to the size of the data sample, and the second is uh, only dependent on the size of the key guess, but the outer key bits have to be paid twice, hence the factor two. A major development was the introduction of the FFT or Walsh transform technique. And uh, we start the same way. We build uh, some uh, distillation table from the data sample, and then we process this vector in the following way. First, we apply uh, the fast wash transform on this vector. And then for each guess of the inner key, we will multiply this vector by the wall spectrum of the key recovery map. We apply the fast wash transform again, and we obtain uh, all the experimental correlations for this inner key guess. So uh, let us go over this a bit more slowly. We start from a data sample and we build the distillation table. In essence, we just count the number of occurrences of the different possible values for uh, the plain text ciphertext bar of the input to the key recovery map. Then we apply the fast was transform. And then we multiply element wise by this vector, which is actually the whole spectrum of the key recovery map. And finally, we just have to apply the fast wash transform again on the resulting vector. So the total complexity of this version of the attack has two terms. The first is proportional to the size of the sample, that is the cost of the distillation phase. And then the cost of the wash transform steps is the total number of key guesses times the number of uh, bits in the outer key guess. So the problem that we want to solve is that uh, in the cryptanalysis of real ciphers, there may be some specific properties that we think should be able to reduce the time complexity, but we don't know how to. How to. For example, uh, if the size of the data sample is relatively small compared to the number of outer key guesses, then the distillation table is a sparse vector. So we ask, do we really have to build it? We also consider that the cipher probably has some kind of key schedule, which will induce relationships between the bits of uh, the key guess. So can we actually use this to reduce the size of the guess effectively uh, in terms of the algorithm? And finally, 
uh, we noticed that previous versions of this attack algorithm consider that uh, the key recovery map is an arbitrary Boolean function, which uh, normally it's, we can deduce it from the construction of the cipher. And uh, we may have some properties which are useful to us. So uh, in this paper, we consider that uh, these redundancies can be expressed as sparsity properties of uh, either the non-zero inputs or the desired outputs of the true world transform steps of the attack. But this raises the following question, which is uh, how can we actually uh, reduce the time complexity of the fast world transform when we restrict the inputs or the outputs? So the rest of this presentation will proceed as follows. First, uh, we will discuss uh, the pruning problem for the fast world transform from a theoretical point of view. Then uh, we will propose uh, some solution to this problem and uh, explain how to use it in uh, the context of linear cryptanalysis. And finally, I will briefly discuss the applications which are uh, described in the paper. So let's forget cryptanalysis for a moment and consider the following theoretical problem. We are given a vector of length two to the n, and uh, we are guaranteed that uh, there is some uh, known affine subspace X, which will contain all the non-zero values in this vector. Uh, we were also given uh, some affine subspace, and uh, we are tasked with computing all the outputs of the fast wall transform of the initial vector, which lie within this affine subspace U. And of course, uh, the question that we want to answer is how can we do this as efficiently as possible? And we're able to prove the following theorem, which is that there is an algorithm which can uh, show, uh, solve this problem if, with complexity, which is essentially three terms. The first is proportional to the total number of uh, non-zero inputs of the transform. The last is proportional to the number of desired outputs. And there is also a middle term whose complexity is that of a fast walls transform of size two to the T, where this parameter T is determined from uh, the subspaces X and U. I think this result is best understood with an example. So we look at uh, the affine subspaces which are shown on the slide. And uh, they are also represented in the picture with uh, highlighted uh, positions. So for comparison, the standard full fast walls transform algorithm would take 64 additions and subtractions in order to compute all the outputs. And if we remove uh, the unnecessary computations from this diagram, we can reduce that to 40. We can also reorder the steps of the fast walls transform and in this way, uh, we can achieve a complexity of just 32 additions and subtractions. However, if we look at this matrix H, which corresponds uh, just uh, to the submatrix of the Hadamard matrix uh, corresponding to the non-zero inputs and the desired outputs, we can notice the following properties. The first is that the pairs of columns corresponding to inputs, which uh, differ by a vector which is orthogonal to U, always appear with opposite signs. So this suggests that our algorithm should start by simply subtracting the pairs of inputs. Next, we look at the rows and we notice, uh, notice a similar property, which is that uh, the pairs of rows which differ by vectors orthogonal to X are always opposite. So this suggests that the algorithm should end uh, simply by copying some register to two different positions of the outputs. And it turns out that we can actually complete this algorithm with a smaller fast walls transform of size two to the four. And in total, uh, this version of the algorithm just requires 16 operations. And this is the basic idea behind uh, the proof of the full result. So there are uh, two things I would like to highlight about uh, this more general result. The first is that the complexity of the algorithm doesn't just depend on the dimensions of X and U, but also on uh, the orthogonality on the two spaces. The larger the orthogonal part that they share, the lower the time complexity of the resulting fast transform. And also I would like to uh, 
briefly describe the general algorithm, which has three steps, as we saw in the example. The first is a compression step where we take all the non-zero inputs and map them to a smaller vector of size two to the t. Then we apply the fast walls transform in uh, this uh, smaller vector. And finally, we have an expansion step where we just copy the outputs of this smaller transform with some sign uh, swaps in uh, some cases. So now let's return to cryptanalysis and look at an example of the kind of properties that we can exploit in uh, the whole spectrum of the key recovery map. So we consider a key recovery map, which looks like this, which might appear, for example, uh, we have an SPN log cipher with uh, a four bit test box and a bit permutation as the linear layer. And we can compute its Walsh coefficients simply by multiplying the Walsh coefficient of the S box, S box corresponding to each part of the input uh, mask to the Walsh coefficient and a fifth uh, Walsh coefficient of the S box, which corresponds to the S box in the second round and uh, which takes this uh, input mask beta, which is actually determined uh, bit by bit by whether each part of the full input mask is equal to zero or not. This has an interesting consequence, which is that when uh, the Walsh coefficient corresponding to the all ones uh, input mask for the S box is equal to zero, then uh, any non-zero uh, Walsh coefficient for the full key recovery map will necessarily have uh, one of these four parts of the mask equal to zero. And uh, this is quite interesting to us because it means that uh, the walls, the support of the wall spectrum of F is contained in four vector subspaces of dimension 12 instead of the full ambient subspace of dimension 16. There are two uh, additional things that we would have to consider. The first is what happens when this wall coefficient is not equal, not equal to zero. So what we can do is uh, select some appropriately chosen inputs to the S-box that we can reject so that this Walsh coefficient becomes zero. And uh, in terms of the attack, what this means is that we reject some uh, small portion of the data. Next, uh, we wonder what happens if we have the addition of an inner key. And uh, it turns out that we can just write uh, the Walsh coefficient uh, for the key, of the key recovery map for any inner key guess in terms of uh, the worst coefficient for the zero key guess. This has two consequences. The first is that the vector subspaces we described in the previous slides apply to all inner key guesses. And the second is that uh, we can actually compute the worst spectrum uh, for F0 and then just did use the wall spectrum for the, all the other keys with some sign drops. So now we return to the walls transform algorithm in, and we will apply everything that we have learned so far. So the first thing we do is uh, using this property of uh, the inner key guess, we can avoid uh, computing the multiplication step separately for each inner key guess. We can just absorb the sign swaps in the first, uh, in, the, in the worst transform step, uh, which follows. And now we will look at the support of the world spectrum of the key recovery map. So we note that uh, whenever we multiply uh, this a value in this vector by zero, we obtain zero, which means that the non-zero inputs to the second world transform step must also be contained in this uh, support of the world spectrum of the key recovery map. And we will assume that there is some subspace U which covers this uh, support. Next, uh, we consider the output side and uh, we consider that because of the key schedule, there is some subspace V which uh, covers all the possible values of the outer key guess. So what we can do is simply apply the pruned uh, fast walls transform algorithm in the second walls transform step and reduce the complexity to a one which depends on this parameter R, which is determined by the orthogonality of U and V. 
if uh, we find ourselves in a situation like the one we actually described in which uh, the support is not covered by a single affine subspace, but a union of affine subspace, we can just use the linearity of the walls transform to separate it into several parts, which are a lot easier to compute. And then we just have to add the results at the end. Next, we look at the first walls transform step, which again is restricted at the output side by the uh, support of the wall spectrum because we don't need to compute something which is going to be multiplied by zero. And again, we can use the prune the fast wall transform algorithm in this step. And there is one final thing that we can do, and it is uh, based on the fact that we notice that for each pair in the data sample, we are going to modify just one position in one of uh, in each one of the compressed arrays which are built in this first was transform step and what this means is that we can actually combine uh, the distillation phase and the compression step of the first was transform so the final algorithm looks something like this and uh, what i'd like to point out is that uh, in the right circumstances this complexity is completely independent from the actual dimension of the input space to the key recovery map, which is something which was not true of previous versions of the attack. Finally, I will briefly sketch uh, the two applications which are described in the paper. The first one is uh, the application to the DES. So we take a uh, Matt Swiss uh, attack on the full DES and uh, consider the 14 round linear approximation, which is used in this attack and we remove the last round of this approximation and uh, we'll cover it with key recovery instead. So normally what would happen is that the cost of the key recovery for this version of the attack is too large. However, we can leverage the wall spectrum of S5 in order to keep the time complexity down. And the result is that we obtain the best known attack in the literature in terms of data complexity. We next uh, look at present. So we take an existing attack on uh, 28 rounds of the 80 bit key variant, and we are able to add an additional round to this attack. Um, so we obtain the first attack on uh, 29 rounds for the 128 bit key version. Again, uh, this, uh, this attack would not be possible were it not for these optimizations. Finally, I would like to discuss uh, some open problems related to this technique. Uh, the first would be to apply it in other scenarios. In particular, we think that uh, differential linear cryptanalysis is a good target because uh, in a differential linear attack, we have to consider essentially the same key guess for each true ciphertext in a pair. So already we have a lot of redundancy on the key guess side. We also think that uh, Designing linear attacks which use uh, this technique is a quite technical and involved process. So it would be nice to have some automatic tools which are able to uh, compute the time complexity of the resulting attack automatically. On a more theoretical side, uh, we still think that there is a lot of redundancy and sparsity in the arrays which appear uh, during the attack. And uh, we believe that this might still be used to reduce the time complexity and especially the memory complexity of the attack. And finally, the big question is whether this technique uh, can also be applied to uh, more general linear layers and not just bit permutations. So thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Do we have questions? Online. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll ask one question. Um, you're talking now of uh, improved use of memory, but I, in uh, in your pruning uh, techniques, does it uh, affect the memory now? Or is, is uh, yes, the the memory is the memory cost is in fact reduced to. Uh, uh, So uh, we can actually reduce the memory basically to this uh, dimension of these smaller spaces. Um, however, 
in uh, real examples, we still notice that there is a lot of repetition. For example, uh, if you look at the whole spectrum of, uh, of this map, uh, you find that there is a lot of repeated values, uh, things like this. So one wonders if there is some uh, compact way of writing these arrays, which uh, saves us some memory, perhaps at the cost of uh, some overhead in the time complexity. But uh, I mean, for example, if you look at the DS attack, it's clear that the double technique here is the memory. The toughest part. Okay, thank you. No question. So let's thank the speaker again. Next talk. So next talk is about statistical decoding 2.0, reducing decoding to LPN uh, by uh, Kevin Carrier, Thomas Debris-Alazar, Charles Meyer-Hilfiger, and Jean-Pierre Tillich. And Charles will give the talk. Thank you, Ferdinand. Uh, so hello, so I'm Charles, and I will present statistical decoding 2.0. Uh, so this is a joint work with Kevin Carrier, Thomas Debris-Alazar, and Jean-Pierre Tillich. So in our paper, we introduce a new algorithm to decode random linear codes. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to, bit, uh, to give a bit of context. So why it is an important problem, the decoding problem? Uh, it is because the security of all code base primitive rely on the hardness of decoding linear codes. Okay, here for example, I've put in, uh, put in some code base primitives. Uh, you have Michaelis, Bike, and HQC, for example, that are in the fourth round of NIST standardization competition. And so uh, all these uh, primitives are based on error correcting codes. Okay. And thus, uh, the complexity of the best decoding algorithm um, are going to be an essential tool for setting up parameters of such primitives. So uh, I'm just going to recall what I'm going to use here. Uh, first, a linear code. So here I'm going to be placed in a binary space. A binary code of length n and dimension k is just a linear subspace of f2 to the power of n of dimension k, okay? And we will call r the rate of the code. And so now we can define formally the decoding distance at distance t, which can be stated as follow. So I give you a noisy code word Y, which is equal to C plus E, where C is a code word and E is an error vector of Hamming weight T. Alors here, the Hamming weight of E is just a number of non-zero coordinates of the vector E. So basically here, the error vector will be a sparse vector. So T will be small. And I ask you to find a code word C belonging to, uh, to the code, uh, such that uh, C minus Y is of Hamming weight T. So this is a hard problem and all the code base primitives rely on that. So here, uh, let's talk a bit about the state of the art. Uh, we are going to interest ourselves at the decoding problem uh, at its hardest distance, namely when T is equal to the Gilbert version of distance. Um, just to give a bit of context, this distance is a distance where you have typically one solution of your decoding problem. So if you take T bigger than this distance, you will have many solutions, and thus you will be able to speed up your algorithm uh, to take uh, into account this. So you will try to find one solution among many. So we place at T the hardest distance. And I have plotted here uh, the complexity exponent of some algorithm that exists today to decode random linear codes. So the first thing you can see here is that the main family of algorithm are called information set dec uh, decoding algorithm, ISD. The first ID was made by Prange in 1962, and then it has been improved uh, over the years. And the last algorithm, the last ISD, is made by both and May in 2018. Okay, but you can also see that there is another algorithm uh, which does not belong to this big family, which is called statistical decoding, and it was introduced by Al Jabri in 2001. So the first thing you can see is that uh, statistical decoding 
is uh, completely incompetitive against ISD. So here uh, you see the complexity exponent of uh, this algorithm. And so you see that statistical decoding complexity exponent is three times higher than the simplest of the ISD. So you also see that it's been like after 60 years of research on this problem, the complexity exponent have only been improved by a factor of 20%. So this is kind of really a hard problem. So now what is our contribution? Uh, so we introduced a new algorithm called RLPN, which will be based on statistical decoding 1.0. Uh, but in statistical decoding 1.0, uh, we will make use of parity check to decode one bit uh, of the uh, error. Okay? But in RLPN, we will use parity check to reduce our decoding problem into an LPN problem, and then we'll solve this LPN problem with uh, typical solvers, usual solvers. And this will lead to a groundbreaking improvement over statistical decoding 1.0. More specifically, here are our results. So uh, I've plotted here the complexity exponent of some decoding algorithm. So in green here, I don't know if you can see it, but you have uh, uh, statistical decoding 1.0, OK? So it's the complexity exponent in function of the rate of the code. Uh, so you see that it's completely uncompetitive. In black here, you have Prange uh, algorithm, which is the simplest of the ISD. In blue, you have button May algorithm, which is the state of the art. And in red, you have our uh, new algorithm RLPN. So you see that uh, we beat all of the previous uh, existing decoding algorithm for rates smaller than 0 0.3. And you can also see that actually for rates close to zero, uh, our algorithm performed in the square root of uh, the naive search, where all of the ISDs perform in the uh, area of the complexity of the naive search. So here, when I'm talking about the, the complexity of the naive search, is just enumerating all the code words and uh, trying to look for one that is uh, at distance t of my noisy code word. So it is important to notice that uh, it's been 60 years since the ISDs have not been improved for, the, for a significant range of parameters of rate. So now, um, before presenting our new algorithm, and to give a bit more context, I will present statistical decoding 1.0. So, the main idea first, before talking about that, rely on the fact that if you have a code C of length n and dimension k, you can consider it's dual. Okay, what is this dual? It's just the elements that are orthogonal to C. Here you see uh, it's all the h such that C dot h is equal to zero for all code words C. So uh, the dual of C is actually a code itself of, of length n and dimension n minus k. And we will call the element of the dual the parity checks of C. And so here, what can you see is that if you have a noisy code word Y, so you don't know C, you don't know E, and you compute the dot product of Y and H, H being a parity check, you have that it is equal to C dot product H plus E dot product H, which is equal to E dot product H, because this term here cancels out, because C and H are orthogonal. And so what will happen is that statistical decoding will make use of that, of that remark, okay? So what it will try to do, it will try to recover one coordinate of the error at a time. For example, let's say here that we will want to try to recover the first coordinate of E, E1. So if we consider a parity check H, such that H1 is equal to one, as before, I can compute y dot product h, which is equal to e dot product h, which is equal to this sum. So this is either 0, either 1. Huh? And so this is equal to this sum. And I can extract the first term of this sum in e1 and plus the rest of the sum. So the main remark here is that this sum here will be biased toward 0. We will call it a noise term. So why did it be biased towards zero? It's because E is an error vector, so it is sparse. And H will be computed such that it is sparse. So H will be a parity check uh, of low amine weight. Okay, so this explains why this will be biased. So if you want to recover E1, you will just compute many parity check, and you will compute Y dot product H. And what you will do is you just do majority voting to recover E1. So you have two cases, either E1 is equal to zero, then Y dot product H follow a Bernoulli of parameter one minus epsilon over two for some epsilon bias. 
And if E1 is equal to 1, then y dot plus h is equal to this, and it follows the Bernoulli distribution of parameter 1 plus epsilon over 2. So here you notice that there is a small difference between the two distribution. And it is a classical result that you need one over epsilon square sample to distinguish the two distribution. Okay, so you need to compute one over epsilon square h uh, to distinguish. So here epsilon is epsilon exponentially small, and it will be a function of n t, the weight of the error, and w. Uh, where I, I don't have the pointer. Uh, okay, of w, uh, the weight of h. Okay. Uh, so here, to be a bit more precise, I floated the number of needed parity check h uh, to be able to distinguish the two distribution. So uh, here, uh, in function of w, the weight of h. So in black here, you have the, the curve uh, which represents the number of needed parity check. And you see that uh, you want w as small as possible. For example, here, uh, you see that uh, when w is small, you need uh, less parity checks. But uh, one thing you can see is that you have an implicit constraint because you need that the number of parity check of a certain way W uh, in your code is superior to uh, the number of needed parity check, uh, of the number of needed parity check. So actually you want W as small as possible because, you, because this will be a lower bound on your complexity. Uh, one over epsilon square will be a lower bound on, on your complexity. But you cannot here, you cannot take W smaller than uh, 0.2, okay? Because you see that 0.2 is the crossing point because the number available and the number needed. So you will need approximately two to the power of uh, 0.2n parity checks. So now we are ready to pre uh, present RLPN. So the main idea of RLPN is instead of recovering one coordinate of the error at a time, we will try to recover many coordinate of the error at a time. So for example, here I will choose a set of position P of size S and I will call N its complementary. And I will try to recover EP. So as before, I can make the same uh, remark. If I take a parity check H, I can compute Y dot product H, which is equal to E dot product H. And then I can split this dot product between, uh, okay, thank you, perfect. So I can split this dot product E dot product H between EP dot product HP and ah, yeah, EP dot product HP plus HN dot product EN. So this will be biased towards zero and uh, we will call it a noise term, okay? And what you will want to try to do is to recover EP from many samples Y dot product H where the samples are given by the parity checks. So I have plotted here the main difference between statistical decoding 1.0 and RLPN. In statistical decoding 1.0, you will take P of size one. So you will want to try uh, to recover one coordinate of the error at a time. And you will compute parity checks of weight W on N, okay? In RLPN, you will take P bigger and thus N will be smaller. And you, you will compute H uh, of a fixed set weight uh, on N, okay? And the main effect of that will be that P, because P is bigger and is smaller, and thus the noise here will become smaller. So in the next slide, I'm going to try to give a small intuition on why it is true. So here, for example, let's consider statistical decoding 1.0. Suppose you have a parity check of weight W on N. So H is of weight W on this part. You can split H in HN in two parts, HN1 here and HN1 and HN2 here. And thus, EN dot product HN are equal to use that this is a noise term. I want it as small as possible. EN dot product HN is equal to HN1 dot product EN1 plus EN2 dot product HN2. Okay. But then in RLPN, because I took H, uh, I took P of size bigger, I this term here, the HN1 dot product HEN1 will not appear in the noise term. So E dot product EN dot product HN will be equal to EN2 dot product HN2. So we'll just have this term here and not this term. And this is why automatically you will have your bias, uh, your noise that will be smaller. 
So to compare a bit the two, uh, first, I need to say that when your noise term, uh, n dot product hn, have a probability of being one of one minus epsilon over two, then uh, information theory tells us that we need one over epsilon square sample to recover EP. It does not tell you how you can do that, but it just tells you that uh, you, you need at least this number of samples. I won't uh, go into the details here, but you can trust me. So in statistical decoding to 1.0, we take P of size one, and I recall here uh, the graph uh, that plots the number of needed parity checks and the number of available parity checks in function of uh, W. And uh, W is the weight of H. And here you can see that you need two to the power of uh, 0.2 N parity check. In RLPN, when P is of size S, of size bigger, um, you see here that the crossing point between, between the number of available of available parity check and the number of needed parity check to decode uh, will lead to a much, you, you will need a much lower number of parity check. Here, the crossing point is at, uh, you need uh, around two to the power of 0.1 N uh, parity check. So actually here, what you have done is you have gained, uh, for example, here a square root factor uh, in, uh, in, uh, in regard to uh, statistical decoding 1.0. So this is, in terms of information theory, it is quite good. Okay. So now there is a problem because in statistical decoding 1.0, P was of size one, and thus to recover EP, I could just do majority voting. Okay. But now when P is of size S, uh, the question is, how can I recover EP? And so now, what can we see is that, in fact, uh, our problem is a well-known, well-studied problem in code-based script cryptography. It can be seen as a LPN problem. So it is here that you will understand why we are reducing decoding to an LPN problem. And the thing is, to recover EP, we will solve this LPN problem. So you can see actually this y dot product h as an LPN sample, okay? And so what is an LPN sample? It's something where you have a secret s that you will want to try to recover, and you have access to s dot product a plus uh, an error term, which will be biased towards zero, okay? And you have access to that, and you have access to a, and you try to recover s. In our precise case, s will be equal to ep, a will be equal to HP. So this is known because you compute the parity check and you can just uh, take H and P. And the noise term will be EN dot product HN. And so it will follow a Bernoulli of parameter one minus epsilon over two. And so if you compute N parity check, you have access to N LPN sample. So one strategy you could make uh, to solve this LPN problem is the most simple one. It's you will try just, you will do a naive search over the space of the solution. So here, uh, you do an exhaustive search of the space F2 to the power of S, which is the length of your uh, secret. And uh, what is it? It corresponds to just finding X such that Y dot product H is equal to X dot product HP the most often. So here, the most often in regard to all the samples you have. So all the H you have. And so the complexity of this algorithm is in N times two to the power of S. So two to the power of S here, because you have to test uh, two to the power of S vectors, and N is because you have N samples. So for each uh, vector here, you have to compute this for N uh, vectors. And so um, what you can do is actually, this exhaustive search can be sped up uh, with a fast Fourier transform. Okay, I won't enter the detail, but it's a standard thing, a standard technique in uh, code-based cryptography. And so your overall complexity is going to be S times two to the power of S. So one thing which is important to mention here is that uh, why you have a big gain between uh, the naive search and the sped up naive search is because N here will typically be, uh, will be exponential. So it will be one over epsilon square, the number of sample you need. And when you optimize our parameters and you look at them, you see that N will be around two to the power of S. So the naive search here will be of a complexity of uh, two to the power of S square. And so uh, our fast Fourier transform gain a square root factor uh, in regard of the naive search. So this is quite a big gain. So our algorithm, uh, we just uh, uh, choose a set P and N, which are complementary. 
uh, and we will try to recover EP, and we compute uh, 1 over epsilon square uh, parity check H uh, of weight W and N. We will do that using standard techniques that come from the ISD that I will describe later. And then you recover EP with fast Fourier transform. And thus the complexity of your algorithm is just the cost of computing those uh, parity checks and the cost of fast Fourier transform. And now, uh, lastly, I'm going to, to present briefly a technique to compute low weight parity checks uh, on the part N. Okay? So this uh, technique was introduced by Doomer in 86. And so uh, the, the main idea is that if you take your parity check and you consider the parity checks that are restrained on N, so you consider this space, you can notice that this space is a code of length N minus S and dimension N minus K. Okay, so it can be written as the kernel of a matrix H prime. So basically what it means, it means that if you want to find parity checks of weight W on N, the thing that you are going to try to do is to find a vector, to find vectors H prime of weight W such that H prime in, is in the kernel of that matrix. Okay, and so the main, uh, the, the naive idea to do that is just to enumerate all the vectors of weight W, but Dummer's idea is to use collision. So he will split the matrix H prime in two equal parts, H1 prime and H2 prime. And then he will notice that um, if you have two vectors of weight uh, W over two, H1 prime and H2 prime, and you have a collision like that, uh, you have this, then you can, uh, then you automatically have a vector H prime, which is a concatenation of H1 prime and H2 prime, and it will be of weight W such that H prime is in the kernel of H, uh, the matrix H prime. Okay, so meaning that if you have a collision, then uh, you, have a, you have a parity checks of weight W uh, on N, okay? So the complexity of this method is basically the cost of enumerating all the vectors of weight W over two, plus the number of equations that will be produced by this method. So basically the number of collision you will find. And so um, why it is interesting to look at that is because uh, I can give you um, a, uh, an intuition on how our parameters will, uh, will be for when the rate R is small. Here, for example, uh, what I can do, and it is really interesting is that I can take W such that the cost of the enumeration will be equal to the number of equations produced. So basically, producing uh, one parity check will cost you one if you have these two terms that balances. And so here you choose uh, this, with, which is equal to this to balance these two terms, and you take S, which is equal to K over two. So this is the choice, just trust me. And if you look at the complexity of RLPN with these parameters, you see that it will be in a square root of two to the power of Rn. So this gives you an intuition on why our algorithm is in the square root of the naive search when R is small, because you, just, you can just take these parameters. And now to conclude, uh, it is the first time in 60 years that uh, ESDs are beaten. Okay, uh, we use, in fact, we use more advanced techniques to compute the weight parity checks on W. I've presented here Doomer, but we will use uh, typically the best al uh, algorithm we use is BGMM12, come from BGMM12, which is, uh, uh, which, which, is an, uh, which is something that is used in an ISD. And uh, it is important to notice that uh, similar techniques are used in Lattice, in dual attacks in Lattice. And actually, you can really see that, that uh, our algorithm, RLPN, dualized uh, the ISD. And so why is that? Is because the ISD compute low weight code words, rely on computing uh, low weight code words, and RLPN rely on computing low weight parity checks. And the resulting effect is that uh, when the ISD are bad, our algorithm is good. We gain a square root factor. When the ISDs uh, are good, uh, our algorithm is bad. Well, enfin, is bad uh, is as a complexity of the nice search. And so we kind of dualize the ISD. Thank you very much. Do you have questions? So I have a question. Uh, you talked at the beginning that you are focusing on the hardest system. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean in your 
why, why do you focus on the other design? How does oh. it come in your algorithm? Oh, uh, it's so it's because so why do we focus on the Gilbert version of distance? Uh, in fact, all the algorithm, the ISDs, and uh, everything has been studied uh, historically. At the, uh, okay, I'm going here. here. Yeah, all those algorithm, Prange, and etc., have been studied at this distance. So it's kind of the historical way of doing things. And actually, there is also uh, another important point. It is that um, typically, uh, when you look at signature schemes, uh, for example, uh, Stern and Fiat Shamir, uh, they place the, 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 the security will rely at, uh, on decoding, uh, decoding a linear code at Gilbert Farsham of distance. So it, is, it will be very, very interesting to study the Gilbert Farsham of distance for uh, estimating the security of uh, code based signature. And so with the NIST call that will go uh, in a few months, uh, it is going to be a major thing to look at. Okay. Let's go on with the next talk of the session. Uh, will be online. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Sorry, okay. can I start already? Yes, yes, sorry. We, we didn't have okay. the, the, the your slide. No, we have lost. So the next talk is a third is all you need extended partial key exposure attack on CRT RSA with additive exponent branding by uh, Yuan Yuan Zhu. Jup van de Paul, Yu Yu, and Francois Xavier Standard, and uh, you are in Yan will give the talk. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for your introduction. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, talk. Um, this is joint work with uh, Yu van de Paul, Yu and uh, Francois Xavier Standard. It's about the extended partial key explorer attack on CRTRC with additive uh, exponent blending. So this talk consists of four parts. The first part is about the state of the art of a partial key exposure attack. Then uh, next, I will introduce you the principle of this uh, extended partial key exposure attack. The third part is about the experimental results of uh, this work. And uh, in the end, I will conclude uh, this talk. So first of all, I will just uh, give you some uh, basic concepts related to this work. As you know, uh, for RSA and CRTRC, they have uh, different uh, key components like uh, private exponents, uh, modulus, uh, uh, public exponents. And um, uh, as, an, as a very widely used uh, uh, countermeasure against side channel attacks, uh, it's called additive exponent blending. It's just uh, add a random multiple of uh, the group order to the private uh, exponents to uh, hide the private uh, exponent. And uh, pay attention to this um, RP and RQ. These are the two uh, random blending factors. We will need this uh, in the uh, next slides. And in general, PKE makes use of the redundant information among these uh, different uh, components. And also here in Please pay attention to the K constant. We call this K or L or K prime and L prime. Um, basically, the PKEs uh, use uh, partial leakage, either consecutive uh, MSB or LSB bits of uh, the K components like P or D or DP prime, DQ prime. That's what we will use in this work. And the state of art of the PKE attack, uh, we categorize into two uh, uh, categories. So the, on the 
left side, you can see the case, there's no exponent blending. The current state of art is uh, published at uh, the Euro crypto this year, uh, May at all, the uh, put forward the state of art. They uh, managed to recover the full CRT key with uh, one third of the uh, unblinded DP and the DQ, either MSB or LSB bits. And on the right side, as you can see, there are not too much uh, works being done uh, regarding the additive exponent blending countermeasure presence. So in this work, we try to uh, uh, fill in this gap. We also managed to recover the full uh, CRTK using one third of the LMSB or LSB of the blended uh, exponents DP prime and the deco prime. I will show you in the late next slides. Uh, also, I need to uh, first recap this Eurocrypt work because this is the base of uh, our work. So this uh, Eurocrypt work is a uh, two-step approach. First, uh, they try to find the CRT K constant K. Um, and then the second step is use this uh, found uh, K constant and K to uh, estimate uh, K times P, and then factor N to get P using this uh, so-called uh, approximate GCD. Um, and for the first step in the MSP case, uh, it's uh, very uh, simple to just solve a quadratic polynomial equation and to get the K constant K. But in the LSP case, um, they use the Cooper Smith method to uh, find the roots of a bivariate polynomial to get the K constant K. The second step of for, uh, both MSB and LSB cases, uh, they are very similar. Uh, it's, uh, just to perform the lattice basis reduction and then solve the root of a univariate polynomial to get the unknown parts of a DP and then factor N. For both uh, steps, uh, for both cases, they can uh, manage to uh, do this uh, in polynomial time. So now I will introduce you the uh, basic idea of this uh, EPKE attack. Uh, so this is our work. We uh, follow this uh, two-step approach, uh, but in this case, we need to uh, first uh, get the CRT K constant and K prime, uh, as I mentioned before. So uh, this uh, depends on the blend factor RP and RQ. Um, all right. uh, so the difference here is uh, the MSP case. Um, we uh, consider the two different scenarios uh, the first scenario is so we have uh, only a single uh, D co prime available, and then we have to factor uh, K prime times L prime, then uh, we can get a K prime. And this uh, product of uh, uh, K prime times L prime is uh, at the size of uh, one sixth of the modulus. And we have uh, experimentally verified this. Uh, uh, very feasible for an you know, for, with a very uh, average uh, PC within uh, like minutes or uh, at most some hours. And uh, uh, the second scenario in the MSB case, uh, imagine we have uh, like multiple DQ prime uh, available, and then we just compute the GCT uh, to get the K prime. And uh, in the LSP case, uh, it's very similar to, to the Eurocrypt work. Uh, we also use the Cooper Smith uh, method to get uh, K prime. The only thing is the polynomial is different from the uh, Eurocrypt one. And um, the second step of this EPK attack, uh, similar to the Eurocrypt work, so I also use this. Uh, uh, approximate uh, GCD method. Uh, based on the found K constant and K prime, we estimate uh, uh, K prime times P, then we factor N to get to P. And uh, for both uh, MSB and the LSP cases, we can do this step in uh, polynomial time. 
because it's similar to the your group work. The difference here is uh, the LSV case because uh, we need to use uh, a model inverse of a uh, uh, item, but the thing is that uh, model inverse doesn't always exist. So we need to do some small trick there. I will show you in uh, later slides. So the third part is about the experimental results. Um, as I said, we need to verify whether this uh, factorization of uh, P prime uh, times L prime is uh, feasible. Uh, so this is the first uh, uh, scenario where we have only single deco prime available. So we do this factorization. We uh, experimented uh, three different uh, uh, K lengths, 1024, 2048, and 3072 bits. And also three typical blending factor lengths, 32, 64, and 128 bits. And as you can see for the factoring time, uh, so this is the step one we were talking about. And uh, yeah, uh, as I said, so with seconds, minutes, or hours. The set step two is the net spaces reductions like uh, uh, within uh, seconds. Uh, more specifically for this uh, factoring time, uh, the picture I showed here is about 100 uh, experiments with different K and uh, different uh, uh, blending factors. And as you can see, the factoring time uh, in this case is just um, uh, within uh, seconds, at most like 30 seconds or so. Uh, this was just a uh, very average uh, uh, PC. And uh, uh, for the 2048 bit key, uh, the factoring time uh, becomes longer, but still like you know, within minutes, uh, at most one, uh, one and a half hours. But uh, it was very rarely uh, happens. And the longest key, uh, 3072, um, in this case, we need uh, like hours or dozens of uh, hours. And then this is the second scenario uh, where we have uh, multiple deco prime available. Uh, as you can see, uh, the result here, uh, this is step uh, one, uh, depending on how many deco prime are available, the success of the probability uh, is different. We tried uh, from two to 10 uh, deco prime available. Uh, as you can see, um, if you have uh, more than like uh, five uh, deco prime available, then uh, the success probability is about uh, uh, already reached one. And we also did some uh, theoretical uh, calculation and the uh, experiments. As you can see, this uh, red one is the expected values of this uh, success probability. And uh, our experiments are very close to the expected values. And to be more specific, um, imagine if you only have uh, two uh, deco prime available, uh, actually we can do this with a small brute force effort without uh, uh, more deco prime available. Uh, that's called uh, we have uh, two K constants L1 prime and L2 prime from this two deco prime. And we calculated the uh, GCD of them. We experiment verified because this F value is very small. So basically after we uh, uh, calculate L prime and uh, L2 prime, we can uh, do brute force of this F. Then we don't need to uh, uh, more uh, deco prime. Also for 2048 bits, as you can see, uh, most of them are uh, below 50. And so even with the longest key, uh, also uh, uh, for most of them, they are below 100. And this is the third scenario, uh, the LSB case. There's not too much to say uh, because both step one and step two, uh, they're using net spaces reduction. And uh, as you can see, basically they are like within uh, minutes or seconds. 
But so we further look into uh, what will uh, uh, be the impact on the real world. Uh, how will this uh, EPK attack uh, behave in the uh, real life? So we uh, consider to demonstrate an application of this uh, EPK attack in the real world, uh, as I'll show you uh, in the next slides. Because as you know, uh, the partial K leakage sources for uh, um, partial K explorer attacks, many from like a side channel attacks or code boots or micro architecture attacks. And in this work, we were considering uh, side channel uh, leakage. And uh, just give you some background of a side channel uh, attacks. That there are different uh, side channels like the execution timing or power consumption. Uh, and so on. And so uh, we normally consider there are four different uh, stages. Like, uh, firstly, you need to marry the side channel traces, uh, and then you do pre processing like uh, alignment or uh, filtering. And then you can do the side channel analysis. The last step was, uh, or last stage is what we call the post analysis. That's what we do this uh, uh, EP key attack after you get partial uh, side channel leakage, how can you uh, get the full key? And uh, there are also different side channel uh, attack methods like uh, simple power analysis or differential power analysis, uh, template attack or deep learning uh, based side channel attacks. That's what we will use in this work. There are also uh, two types of uh, uh, attacks. We call the profiling ones and uh, long profiling ones. In this work, uh, we consider the profiling ones and uh, regarding the potential impacts on our real life, uh, especially for embedded devices, they uh, often uh, use uh, CRT uh, for performance uh, consideration. And so also most of them are using this additive exponent plan because it's very easy to in implement and also the cost is not too much. Uh, as I said, it is a very common countermeasure against the side channel attacks. And so also by the end of uh, last year, uh, based on the data from uh, EM vehicle, um, they uh, circulate uh, more than around uh, about uh, 12 billion cheap cars internationally. And uh, for those cars, uh, RC or CRT RC are used by default. So uh, can imagine what if an uh, attacker can uh, obtain one third of this uh, uh, MSB or LSB of the blended the DP prime and the deco prime. I will show you now. So uh, in this work, we consider a monochromal laser uh, exponentiation of a uh, secure uh, micro uh, microcontroller. The k is 2048, and uh, the use of the additive uh, blending factor is uh, 64 bits known. And we uh, use this uh, deep learning search attacks to recover uh, 411 bits MSB or 441 bits LSB uh, for the blended DP prime and the deco prime. Uh, we consider um, 10 attack case uh, in each uh, scenario. As you can see, this picture uh, shows the training accuracy and uh, validation accuracy of this deep learning such uh, attacks. And after this, we got the MSB, the one third of MSB or uh, LSB for DP prime and the deco prime. And then we apply this EP attack to recover the full uh, CRT key. So for all this uh, 10 MSB case, we uh, recover uh, the full key. Uh, the step one, the factor in time is uh, within like uh, seconds or uh, minutes. Uh, also, for the LSP case, we managed to recover all the uh, full case. So, to conclude my talk, uh, in this work, we managed to to forward the state of art uh, regarding the different exponent blending uh, using only one third of MSB or LSP uh, of uh, additive blended DP prime and the DQ prime to uh, uh, recover the full key. The results are uh, similar to the Euro group one, uh, where blending is not uh, present. So in 
in this sense, we don't need more bits, but of course there's a price to pay. So we either need to factor an integer at the size of uh, one six of the modulus, or we do uh, uh, GCD uh, using multiple uh, deco prime. And so when we apply this uh, Euro curve for idea to this additive blending scenario, we had to uh, overcome some difficulties uh, because based on the known information, we can calculate the uh, modular sum k prime plus l prime of the e, but we uh, it's not trivial to derive a k prime times uh, uh, plus l prime. Also, it's not uh, trivial to derive a k times l uh, from the modular uh, uh, products uh, k prime uh, times l prime. Uh, in the LCP case, as I mentioned before, uh, this uh, GCD uh, of uh, two uh, known parts um, is not always equal uh, to one. So we uh, had to find out a trick to uh, solve this problem. And the last uh, thing is about the advantage of this uh, EPK attack especially for uh, embedded devices. Because as I said, uh, imagine uh, you only need to uh, mirror one third of the exponentiation. Uh, you don't need to capture, because uh, for such an attacks, the measurement uh, time is uh, very uh, significant. Um, so this will greatly speed up the acquisition. Uh, based on our experiments, we uh, practically verify uh, this. We don't need to use the uh, same measurement for D P prime and D co prime. We can use different measurements, targets uh, D P prime and or D co prime. There's an open problem left. Is uh, how can we deal with the early space of D P prime and D co prime? Uh, in this uh, side channel application we did here, we just uh, recover more uh, traces. Uh, and then we try to uh, solve this problem. But we need uh, uh, error, uh, error free DP prime and deco prime. Thanks for your attention. I'd like to take your questions. Thank you for the talk. Do we have question? No question? Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. So now is the last talk of the session. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you see my slides right now? We can see your slides. We cannot see you, but we can see your slides. Yes. Okay, okay. okay so can I start so, now? Yeah, so now we're going to talk about strength, stretching cube attacks, improved methods to recover massive square bodies by Jia Hui He, Kai Hu, Bart Prenil, and Mei King Wong. And uh, Zhang Hui will give the talk. Please go ahead. OK, thanks for the, intro uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jia Hui He. And uh, today, I will present our work named the Stretching Cube Attacks Improved the Methods to Recover Massive Super Polis. And this is a joint work with Kai Hu, Bart Prenil, and Mei King Wong. Uh, this is the outline of our presentation. I will introduce our work from the following five aspects. First, I will briefly uh, introduce us some background knowledge about the uh, cube attack and the superpoly recovery. Then, then I will analyze the bottleneck of the nested monomer predictions and uh, show our improvements. Finally, our improvements lead to new results of superpoly recovery. And this further 
requires us to design a new method for recovering keys from a massive superpod. Okay, so the Cuban attack was proposed by Dina and Shami at Eurocrypt 2009. Uh, any output bit of a symmetric cipher can be expressed as a Boolean function of the secret, secret variables K and the public variables X. The coefficient of a cube term uh, X to U in this Boolean function is called the super poly, and its value can be calculated according to the Mobius transform. Uh, in the online phase of the cube attack, the attacker can fix the non cube variables to constants and recover the exact expression of the super poly. Then, in the online phase, he can calculate the value of the super poly and establish an equation for K. And some information of K can be extracted by solving the equation. Uh, in the early stage of the cube attack, only linear or quadratic uh, or quadratic super polish are mainly targeted. Later, thanks to the introduction of the division property and the and the MLT modeling method, even complex super polish can be recovered practically. Uh, the division property can also be revisited from uh, from an algebraic perspective, and this leads this lead to the so-called monomer prediction technique. Uh, at Asia Crypt 2021, Ueto proposed a framework called uh, nested monomer predictions uh, by combining the divide and conquer strategy with the monomer prediction technique. And our work is a natural follow up to their work. The conventional bit based duration property was uh, originally proposed as a bit le uh, level generalization of the integral property. And later, Ueto showed that. It can achieve perfect accuracy. It can achieve perfect accuracy in uh, claiming the uh, in claiming that a specific set of monomials of the import is not contained by the NF of uh, output bit. However, CBDP cannot be used to predict the presence of a monomial of the import. For a, compo for a composite Boolean function setting x to y, the monomial, the monomial prediction or division property allows to predict if x to u appears in the NF of y to v by counting the number of monomial or division trails. And for a cube term x to u, if we can determine all the uh, all the possible gk x to u contained by f, then we can determine the super poly accordingly. Uh, next, I will analyze the nested monom. I will analyze the mo nested monomial predictions from a perspective of structure. Uh, actually, the nested monomial predictions consists of two components, uh, which we call the coefficient solver and the term expander. Uh, the coefficient solver is mainly uh, responsible for computing the super poly for uh, for for a term within a time limit, uh, while the term expander is to expand the uh, uh, also, the terms into terms of a different. I think these two parts are run iteratively until no answer of the terms remain. Uh, in particular, the nested monomer predictions utilizes the monomer prediction to build the term expander and the coefficient solver. However, as the number of runs grows, uh, counting the number of monomial trails at once will become impractical. So consequently, uh, during each iteration, too many terms are determined as unsolved by the coefficient solver. And this is at the cost of wasting a lot of time. Therefore, we would like to redesign the coefficient solver. Next, I will introduce the main contribution. I will introduce the main contribution of our work, namely the two-stage coefficient solver. Uh, for clarity, the target of our coefficient solver is always uh, as, uh, is always uh, uh, around the cryptographic function f with x and k as inputs. And uh, k and, uh, well, uh, here k and x denote the secret and the public variables respectively. The output of the ice round is determined as s plus uh, si plus y. We always fix x to u as uh, the cube term. And the pi u r s r as the as the output monomial of us round. 
so non cubic variables is set to uh, so non cubic variables are set to zero, and uh, the goal of our coefficient solver is to compute the superpoly of XTU in pi U R S R. Uh, in particular, we treat K as non zero constants. Uh, inspired by the divide and conquer strategy, we would like uh, we first would like to uh, divide pi U R S R into terms of IMS round. And of course, I am should be less than R. Uh, we first investigate which terms of I am round will contribute to the divider superpoly. And this directly gives rise to the concept of valuable terms. Uh, a term of I am round, uh, a term of I uh, a term of I am round is a valuable term if there are other number of monomial truths from this term to pi uh, U R And we call this condition condition A. And there should exist a vector W such that Q to W X to U has a monomial show to this term. And this is called a condition B. It, it should be noted that I am here is a fixed value for a specific cipher. For example, we may say it I am to 94 trivium. And, and now we can divide our coefficient solver into two stages. Uh, after the first stage, we try to recover the Valuable terms of IM round within a time limit. And uh, at the second stage, we use the monomial prediction technique to recover the superpoly for each valuable term. And we then collect the results. Uh, since IM is usually very small, the second stage can always be done very quickly. So, uh, so most of the time consuming part should be the first stage. And if the first stage is not completed uh, within the time limit, we say the, we say the term. ITRSR is unsolved. Now the remaining problem is how to model valuable terms. Uh, condition A can be modeled by the, by the monomial prediction perfectly, while for condition B, uh, using the monomial prediction seems overly precise. This inspires us to treat some accuracy for efficiency. And this is also our motivation. Uh, before introducing our uh, new modeling method, let me first introduce our flag technique. This is quite similar to the one proposed by Wang Edo at Crypto 2018. Specifically, for each bit B of the output state of S round, we assign it an uh, additional flag. There are three choices for the flag. Uh, zero C means B is a constant zero bit. Delta means the NF of B involves at least one cube variable. One C means uh, B is now zero and its NF doesn't involve any cube variables. We can also define the following basic. Uh, we can also define the following basic operations uh, for the computation of flags. And with the help of these rules, we can compute the flags for each bit round by round immediately. And this does not require the help of an MLP solver. Uh, for a term denoted by pi tj sj uh, in the just round, we can divide the vector tj into three bit vectors uh, according to the flags of sj. Uh, for the sake of understanding, I temporarily call these three vectors 1c vector, 0c vector, and delta vector. For example, if the Flag of the i speed of the of the vector sj is delta. Then the i speed of the delta vector is equal to the i speed of the vector tj. Otherwise, it is zero. Uh, further, according to these three vectors, we can we can express pi tj sj as the product of these three parts, which we call the one c part, uh, a zero c part, and the delta part of the monomial pi tj sj. So now it's time to introduce how to model condition B. Our first attempt is to exclude the propagation related to constant zero bits for the CBDP. And this gives rise to, uh, to the MBDP. And it can be shown that uh, whether the condition B holds is equivalent to whether there exists a vector GIM less than GIM, such that all zero vector cascading U has an MBDP division shell to KIM. 
by connecting MBDP with MP, we can construct an MLP model called MBDP MP model. Uh, and the, the propagation of the first IM rounds is described according to the rules of MBDP. Uh, the propagation of the next R minus IM rounds is described according to the rules of MP. In the middle, two constraints are imposed according to the definition of MBDP. Combined with the term expander of NMP, this MBDP-based MBDP based coefficient solver allowed to recover the superpoly of a 15-4 dimensional cube for 846 rounds of trivium in about two days. Uh, however, apart from this result, no other superpolys were recovered. Uh, note that the two solutions of an MLP model are considered different if they take a different values on at least one of the involved uh, one of the involved MLP variables. For vector GIM with a high hammer weight, uh, there may be many choices for the vector KIM, and this makes the number of solutions of the MBDP MP model extraordinarily large. And this is exactly where the bottleneck of the MBDP MP model lies. To address the bottleneck of MBDP, we propose a technique called homonormal prediction. Uh, now consider a vectorial Boolean function G involved in the graphic, uh, involved in the graphic function F, with A and Y be the input and output of G. Once the cube term is is chosen and the non cubic variables are set to zero, the flags of Z and Y can be calculated immediately. Uh, next, we consider the monomial Y to V. We express the delta part of Y to V as a polynomial of Z. If a non zero monomial Z to mu appears in, the, in this polynomial, we say the delta part of Z to mu can propagate to the delta part of Y to V by the common number prediction. And we denote this factor by this. As you can see, the common number prediction only captures the propagation of the delta part of each non-zero monomial. Uh, similar to the definition of, of monomial trail, we can also give a definition of common monomial trail. Uh, and as a result, condition B is equivalently reduced to the problem of whether there exists a common normal trail from k to zero x to u to the delta part of pi t i m s i m. To make it more clear, uh, to make it clear, we show an example. Let's say and y be defined like this. And let the cube term be x zero x y. This means x two is set to zero. First, we can compute the flags for x, k, y, z. Then we can uh, compute all monomial uh, we, we can compute all monomials of y, and we find the only co-monomial uh, only from x zero, x one to uh, y zero, y one. Again, by computing all monomials of z, we find the two co-monomial trails from y zero, y one to the delta part of monomials of Z. Uh, finally, we find the two co-monomial trails from the delta part of monomials of X to the delta part of monomials of Z. Uh, this may sound a bit complicated. So next uh, we give uh, uh, we give the general general propagation rules for CMP. As I mentioned before, the co-monomial prediction is always considered under cryptographic function f and a cube term x to u. Uh, still, we consider the function g sending z to y. Uh, now, given the delta part of y to v are this, we want to determine which monomials of z can propagate to it by CMP. First, we can express the delta part of y to v as a polynomial of z. Then for then for each non-zero monomial appearing in this polynomial, uh, we say the delta part of this monomial can propagate to the delta part of y to v by CMP. Based on this general rule, we also give the propagation rules of copy, XOR, and uh, and operations for CMP in our paper. 
similar to the MBDPMP model. Uh, using, using CMP, we can also construct a MAPP model called CMPMP model. And the propagation of the first IM runs is described by CMP. In the middle part, we require the delta part of IKM assay. Uh, we require the delta part of pi KIM SIM is equal to the delta part of pi TIM SIM. And of course, the propagation related to constant zero bits is still not allowed. Uh, if we use the monomial prediction to recover the valuable terms, uh, the MRP model should be like this. And we call this model uh, MPMP model. And we can prove that the number of solutions of CMPMP model uh, will not be larger than that of the MFP, uh, will not be larger than that of the MPMP model. The CMP-based coefficient solver greatly speeds up the superpoly recovery, and as a result, we are able to recover the superpoly for more rounds of several string ciphers. Uh, considering the superpolys of icon do not involve uh, do not involve four sequential variables. Actually, it only involve less than one hundred and twenty five sequential variables. So, so we can directly derive a cube attack on seven hundred and seventy six rounds of icon with a time time comp uh, with a time comp uh, with two to the one hundred and twenty seven icon cores. Uh, the remaining problem is how to mount a cube attack using superpolis involving four qubits. Uh, first, we observe that during the Mobius transform from NF to choose table, a part of choose table have already, has already been determined. Uh, this observation allows us not only to determine a candidate key during the Mobius transform, but also to check whether the candidate key is the correct key compared to the Conventional method that if uh, that uh, 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 compared to the conventional method of creating a table first and then querying it, uh, this observation can help us save the querying cost. Uh, next, I will I will illustrate our uh, concrete key recovery method by taking eight hundred and forty eight rounds of trivium as an example. Uh, let the, equation, let the equation is published by the superpoly be pk0 to k79 equals a. And here a is a binary value. According to our test, p is a 25 degree polynomial containing, a progress, uh, containing about 2 to the 30.5 terms. First, we can guess the values of the last 40 secret variables and reduce P to a polynomial P prime involving only the first 40 secret variables. And then apply the Mobius transform to the P prime. Uh, when some value of P prime is determined equal to A during the Mobius transform, we can obtain a, we can obtain a candidate P. We then check if this candidate key is correct by a single trivial call. And due to the sparsity of the superpoly, the, uh, the, time, uh, the time complexity of the first step should be, should be negligible. Uh, and such a key recovery method only requires two, two, uh, only requires two to the 40, uh, two to the 40 bits memory and uh, slightly more than two to the 79 trillion cores. And it is, uh, these are the results of our final cube attacks. Uh, to summarize our work, uh, Thanks to the proposal of a two-stage coefficient solver, uh, where the first stage is accelerated with the core monomer prediction, we succeeded in recovering the superpoly for four round radius stream ciphers and, and improving the cube attacks on them. Uh, finally, thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can ask, you can ask, uh, you can ask, uh, you can ask me right now or uh, can contact me later via the following email. Thank you. Do we have any question? No. Okay, then let's exit the speaker again. Thank you. Hi. Uh, some short announcements. 
And for those uh, who need it, uh, luggage may be left behind the uh, um, 